Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts, thankful for the opportunity to gather in your presence. We acknowledge your greatness and your love for us. As we begin this service, we ask that you cleanse our minds and hearts and prepare us to receive your message, Lord. Please help us to set aside distractions and focus on your truth. May your spirit guide us, comfort us, and empower us to live according to your will. We pray for your blessing on our time together and for the guidance of your Holy Spirit in all that we do. May our worship be pleasing to you and may we be transformed by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's better than love. 
You can clap those hands for our God. He's worthy of all praise. Let's sing it out. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, though my only aim, is that you reign. Hebrews 9, therefore, Hebrews 10, sorry, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean 
from an evil cautious and our bodies washed with pure water and verse 23 says let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful we serve a very good God a holy God who made a way for us to enter into the holy place the holy of holies as we sing this next song his mercy is more indeed his mercy is more his grace is sufficient that he made a way for you and I as sinful as we are to come into his presence even as our sins are so many his mercy is more therefore in just one minute just go ahead and thank God for the grace for the mercy for the peace that we have that we can enter in that he welcomes us that he washes us that he cleanses us in your own language in your own way just let's thank him
for you are in this place healing our hearts mending us drawing us to yourself and doing your work because you are not limited by anything you are great oh God you are faithful
that while we were lost, while we were enemies of God, you came as a bridge. Thank you, Jesus. There is no one like you. In our mess, thank you, Lord. You are there. You make us holy. You transform our hearts, Lord, to be more like you, to bear good fruit. Oh, what sweet grace. Thank you, Jesus.
shall we pray lord indeed you're rich in mercy lord your word tells us that your mercies are new every morning lord this morning we saw sunrise lord a reminder of your mercy lord your word teaches us that where sin abounded your gra your grace abounded even the more Lord, we can never, ever exhaust your mercy. Lord, you're so rich in mercy, you reached out to us and in your will and your love decided to forgive all our sins. All of them are completely written off, our dates completely canceled, our sins completely washed away and thrown away never to be brought against us ever again. Lord, you're faithful. You're faithful to each word that you spoke, O oh God. You will fulfill every promise that you made, and you do so, God, every day. We see your faithfulness come to pass in our lives. Lord, you promised us a Savior, Savior came. You promised us eternal life through him. You gave each one of us eternal life. You promised to rise from the dead. Lord, you did. You conquered death. You promised to be with us. You are here with us. That's why we are gathered. You promised, Lord, to love us. You do love us dearly. Lord, you promised to watch over us. You do so every day. You promised to provide for us, to take care of us, just like you do for the sparrows, oh God, more so you do for us, providing every need, oh God. Lord, you promise to give us strength when we are weak, Lord, and we know, we know it to be true that when we are weak, Lord, you are the one who gives us the strength that we need. Lord, you promised us wisdom. You promised to show us the way. You promised to teach us your ways. You promised, Lord, to give us a new heart, the new spirit, oh God. You promised to guide us and to lead us. You do so every day. It's our ears and hearts that get hardened. But Lord, you are always teaching us about who you are, about the way we should go. Lord, you promised that you will come for us. Lord, you promised that where you are, Lord, we will be. Lord, you promised that you would prepare a place for us. Lord, you're still doing that. We can't even imagine how beautiful that place is. We look forward to being there. Lord, you sent us out. You told us, go. Go and shine my light. Go and proclaim my word. Go and do everything, everything that you set your hands on to do it for you, to love you with our strength, with our hands, with our feet, with our mind, with our everything. Lord, you called us to love one another to lay down our lives, to show that we love you by loving one another. Lord, we want to commit ourselves to that. Lord, as you rain down your mercy upon us and your grace and, and your faithfulness, Lord, you asked us to do the same. That we may be merciful to one another, God. That we may be faithful to each other's friends and brothers. That we may be gracious, oh God, just like you are gracious. So, Lord, here we are before you. We are witnesses of your mercy, witnesses of your faithfulness, witnesses of your grace. Lord, may you continue showering down your mercy upon us. Lord, we are still on this journey of growth. 
we still have some stubbornness in us. We still wrestle with sin. We, we have an enemy to fight. Lord, rain down your mercies upon us. Lord, often we forget your, uh, your, your faithfulness and your promises, oh God. Remind, one, uh, remind us, oh God. Remind us to receive them every day. Hundreds of them, thousands of them, oh God. Lord, every so often, our sight of you is foggy, not because you are hard to understand, but our minds and our hearts are limited in understanding. So Lord, just continue giving us a clearer vision of who you are. Continue reminding us and teaching us the truth that you've given us. Teach us about yourself, oh God. Teach us about your kingdom. Teach us about us, your children. So, Lord, we want to give ourselves to worship you, Lord. We want to give ourselves to bow down before you, to honor you. With everything that we do, to surrender to you, O oh God. To give our all. To give our all, O oh God. So be glorified. Be honored, O oh God. Be praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Would you please get up and greet as many as possible around you? And you're all welcome to Calvary Chapel, Kampala this morning. It's perfect weather for tea and coffee. So after the service, please hang around some more. And thank God for the rain, right? A few days of, of fresh weather. God, you're so good. <laughs> Washing all the dust. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 14. Almost at the end of Mark. Mark chapter 14, the first 11 verses. We're going to see a tale of the Jewish leaders, Mary and Judas. We're going to compare and contrast them. Let's read together the text. Mark chapter 14, after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask, poured it, on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always and whenever. You wish you may do to them, uh, whenever you wish, do to them good, but me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. I shall say to you, wherever this gospel is preached, in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them, and when they had it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Lord, we, we see here a tale of hatred and, and rejection, a plot to kill you, 
give you in to be arrested and killed for very little money. We also see on the opposite one pouring their entire treasure upon you. Giving it in worship, in adoration, in gratefulness. Completely selfless. Lord, withholding nothing from you. Lord, many may still reject you today. Many may still walk away from you. We know that you love them dearly. You love us all dearly. Lord, we want to be those who open up any treasure we have. Our hearts, our minds, everything on, Lord. We want to give it all to you. To glorify your name. To thank you for your goodness. To worship you because you're God, your Lord, your Savior. So may, may this be us, O oh God, daily doing this, daily giving you ourselves and our everything. Lord, it is you who can keep them safe. Keep them safe for God. Under your care where, Lord, there will be no rust, where thieves cannot break in and steal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a few days to observe the Feast of Passover, and so we have the Jewish leaders on one side looking for ways to arrest Christ and crucify him. And then we have Mary at Bethany giving her all, and then Judas finally agreed to do so, to hand over Jesus, to identify him publicly, and he would be arrested, tried, crucified. So the Jewish feast of Passover was approaching so Jesus, in you know, Mark's gospel, is kind of compressed. And, and literally here, Jesus is going to be crucified in a few days. So if Passover is going to be observed two days from now, he just has these very few days. And he chooses to spend it at Simon the leper's house. And I think it was kind of a house party. Mary and Martha and probably Lazarus are there. In Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 to 8, God required the Israelites to remember and to celebrate their deliverance from Egypt, Feast of Passover, and remember how urgently it had to happen, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 to 8, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight in the Lord's, uh, is the Lord's Passover. So the fourth month became the first month. Month, I think we call it April. On the 14th day of the first month, midnight. And on the 15th day after the Passover of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat bread without leaven or yeast. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire, that's a burnt offering, to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. One of the things that I, I would have loved to enjoy during the celebrations of this feast was just having a week off. God just says, just, just have a week off, right? Have you ever gone to work and your boss looks at you like, hey, you, you okay? And I'm, I'm just 
you know, trying to make it to the end of the month. Uh, you, you deserve a week off. Just go home. Do no work. And you're going to get a full pay. <laughs> are, you, are you such a boss? Or are you thinking, I, I need to give you some more work? <laughs> and you give your employee a, a lecture on how to work hard and how to work smart and how to be more productive? God literally says to them, these feasts, and not only for you to remember what happened the first, but also for you to just rest, do no work. I look forward to being in heaven because there won't, there won't be any work there. <laughs> While here, somehow we have to get lots of work done. But the celebration was, one, Passover, remember how at midnight, you are freed. And because they didn't have time to make bread with yeast, that ingredient that caused it to rise, they kind of just baked, if, if you watch um, Jewish movies, uh, that bread basically looks like naan, the Indian naan, or our chapati. They just kind of had to mix the dough and flatten it and, and put it on the fire and eat it right there. Basically, God told them, you are living now. So if you're going to have any meal, you're going to have it really quick. And the first meal was Passover. They had to get a lamb, slaughter it, the blood smeared on the door, and that would be their protection from death. And part of the lamb they had to eat with bitter herbs, and the other they had to offer to the Lord. So every possible preparation was made for Passover right now in Jerusalem, and this lasted, a, the preparation to Passover was a whole month, and every household had to sit down and retell the story of their freedom from Egypt. Every synagogue, the grand event happens obviously at the temple, and the pilgrims were coming from all over, literally all over the world. Now, the ones that had to be there were those who lived 15 miles from Jerusalem, but many were coming from as far as Egypt, as far as Western Europe, as far as wherever, hundreds of miles away. And those who could not raise the ship and walk with the ship to Jerusalem just went and bought the ship there. They had converted some of the temple compound into a mole which Jesus would cleanse. And then on that day, they literally sat down. Thursday night, not even, not, not even during the day. They, they had to celebrate Passover just like it was when they left Egypt at night. Midnight a sacrifice, a lamb. Shortly after that, make freshly baked bread. Eat it, and you're going to eat that for seven days. The feast of Passover was to remind them that they were freed from slavery. The feast of unleavened bread was to remind them that their freedom happened really quick. It was urgent. A version of Passover is partaking of the Holy Communion. As we remember when Jesus would be the Passover lamb, he died for us. His body was broken, his blood was shed. We do that every month. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a reminder for us to flee from sin to live lives that are completely given to holiness, to be ready to serve, to be quick. When God told them, pack up, you're going to leave tonight, they had to pack up and get ready to leave. And when God tells us, pack up, you need to go this way, pack up, you need to change this way, pack up, you need to do this, that is us feasting on unleavened bread. When God gives a command, we have to be quick to respond quite often, maybe most of the time we are slow, but we have to be quick. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 to 8, Paul writes using this context, he says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lamp, 
this whole idea of eating unleavened bread. Said, leave your old, slow, sinful lifestyle behind. Because you have been made new and God did it instantly. Remember the day you got saved? It happened right there. You said, Jesus, come into my life. I am now your son. Forgive me all my sins. Cleanse me. I am all yours. And that was it. He didn't have to think about it for a week. He didn't say, ah, let, let me pray about that. You know how we Christians can, can say no to people? Yeah, I'll be praying about that. Could you please, could you please save me with this? Yeah, let, let me think about that. Basically, that means no, right? <laughs> God said, that's it. You're now my son. And from that point on, you are new. We were new. He says, since you are truly unleavened, God took away the sin. So living here is a, is a picture of sin. And says, now you've, you have been unleavened. You, you don't have any sin. You've, you've been made righteous through the blood of Christ. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Remember, the Egyptians lost all their firstborns. The would-be Pharaoh died that night. Pharaoh's heir died that night. The cows died. The gods died. Every firstborn died. For the Israelites, they were freed. Completely freed. They literally packed up after bondage for generations, 400 years. We, we can't even imagine how excited they were to go home. Just imagine you lived away from your home for hundreds of years. And literally, if you're the first generation to go into captivity, your children were born there, your grandchildren born there, great-grandchildren, maybe to the fifth or sixth generation, 400 years. And, and everybody knows the story. Just imagine hearing, now you're not in slavery anymore. Please pack up and go home. A huge celebration. In fact, Joseph even instructed his, his family, please don't, don't leave my bones in Egypt. You can leave other people's bones in Egypt, but mine, I want to be buried home. Christ is our Passover. When, when God calls us to holiness, when he, called, uh, he calls us to righteousness, when he trains us to walk in righteousness. He says this to us. I am your Passover. I have rescued you from death. One of the reasons we should give ourselves to holiness is that we have been rescued from death. We were in a pit, literally, going to be buried. We use the phrase six feet under. And then God comes and gives us life and pulls us out. And he says, from that point on, please live for me. I just rescued you. Rescued you from jaws of death. He says, let us, therefore, keep the feast. Let's, therefore, celebrate. Let's, therefore, remember how we're rescued, not with all living, not with the old lifestyle, nor with the living of malice. He gives some examples of sin here, malice and any form of wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Purity and righteousness. That's how we live our lives. And, and think about it. If God was this gracious and this loving, to pull us out, not just danger, literally death. Don't we have all reasons to walk for him, to walk with him, to serve him, to surrender to him? If God himself poured every form of cost for freedom, Shouldn't we live for him? Now, Paul is writing the, to, uh, to the Corinthians, and they were Christians, but they were living like they really never got saved. The church of Corinth was pretty much, first of all, a disorganized church, but he says, a carnal church, a 
a Christian who does not live like a Christian. One who has been saved but lives like they've never been saved. And said, you can't do that. You have been saved. You're a new lamp. You're a new person. You have new life. Christ died for you. He rescued you from your sinfulness, from death. He says, now you need to live your life, a picture of celebrating the feast, not with the sinfulness that you had, but with the newness that you have. Throw away every form of malice and wickedness. Now you have to put on sincerity and truth. Now, much as that was the, the, the reason they celebrated Passover, it, it's literally worship God because he rescued you and live for him because he gave you his righteousness. Look what the Jewish leaders are doing. At the time when they're supposed to worship God because, they are, because of their freedom from Egypt and live for God because of how God is very quickly and urgently, they are literally filling themselves with wickedness and they want to kill. They literally want to kill. So let's imagine, well, let's put this aside. They literally would have planned to kill anybody they wanted to kill. At the time when their hearts should reflect upon the holiness, the power, the faithfulness, the mercy of God, at, the, at this time is when they are thinking, we need to give ourselves to as much wickedness as possible. We need to find somebody who can help us find Jesus Christ. We need, to, we need to arrest him and crucify him. And the Bible tells us it's because of envy. Are we often like this? Are the times when we know we're supposed to give ourselves to righteousness is when we forget about God's righteousness. We forget about his sacrifice. We forget about his love. And we give ourselves to extreme wickedness. We can be just like this. And Paul reminds us, not anymore. Purge out the old living. Drop sin. Be the new lamp that you are. Be the Christian. Let us be the Christians that we are. You have been redeemed. You have been unleavened. Christ died for us, shed his blood for us. Let us live for him. Now, there's obviously opportunity for us to give ourselves to wickedness. It's called temptation. But there's also opportunity for us to be a new lamp, to drop any form of malice and wickedness, and to live with sincerity and truth. And see what Mary does. So in the extreme, instead of celebrating righteousness and freedom, they're giving themselves to wickedness. And then Mary is now the classic example of how we should observe the feast of Passover, of how we should live our lives. In verse 3 onwards, there are three to nine, at Bethany near Jerusalem, at Simon the leper's house, under the Old Testament law, Jesus wasn't even supposed to be in this house. We do not know if Simon was still a leper at the time, or God had healed him, but somehow the name stuck, or Simon the leper, but he's not leprous anymore. But under the Old Testament law, that house is unclean, and everybody who goes into that house is unclean, and they're not even supposed to observe the Feast of Passover. Disqualified. Again, the mercy and grace of God. He will go to the unclean to make them clean. That's us. Just like Simon. We're all like Simon. Stained with sin. And he says, I'm coming to your house. He went to Zacchaeus' house. Everybody knew he was an, a very, I mean, let's call it, by its name. He was a thief. And he, tell, he told everybody, I'm, I'm going to Zacchaeus' house. And people are thinking, that thief, that dishonest tax collector? And he said, yeah, that's, those are the people I came for. I came for the dishonest, the thieves, the lawbreakers. I came for the criminals. I came for everybody. 
who is a sinner, who is willing to turn away from sin. I came for them. So he's at Bethany, the house of Simon the leper, sat at the table. Their hospitality was that because of the similar to our environment, if, if I walked just one kilometer to a place, to your house, it will be dusty, my feet will be dusty. So when a guest arrived at the house, the slaves or the servants of the house had to wash the guest's feet and, you know, give them some, some oil, right? Just, just anoint them with oil, smear their hands and, and, and smear. Oil was pretty much like a sanitizer, but also it was um, an aroma, you, you've been through a sweaty, dusty path. So you come into somebody's house, you kind of have to refresh. Wash your hands, wash your feet, and smell, some, and smell some aroma, and then come in and feast. What Mary does is not that. She's not even a servant in that house. It would be somebody who works for Simon. She's not even a servant. She does not work for Simon. Looks like someone just invited them over. Please come, we have a meal in preparation for Passover. They would leave Bethany and go to another place to observe the feast of Passover the following night. And then she brought her clay jar full of expensive oil. From what some say, the critics say, just calculate your salary by 12. It was worth your year's salary. Calculate your salary by 12. That was how much this costed. And she does not just anoint or smear his feet and hands ready for a meal. He literally pours everything out on him. Everything. This is how they stored their wealth. Perfumes are still very expensive today. And in some places, people still use perfumes as, as their treasure. They are very easy to sell. I mean, you just put it out, people smell the scent, and it's gone. And people are actually willing to buy expensive perfumes um, just because of the scent, like, oh, this thing smells good. I want to smell good. I want, to, I want my house to smell good. So it was something very quick to sell. So today maybe people use, um, you know, gold. Countries use gold and other things as, um, as a reserve. And uh, some people still prefer cash, just, just want to keep my cash. There are people who still don't want to keep their money in the bank, like, no, I want my cash. I just, I'll just move with it in a sack. That's my treasure. Just think about your treasure. This is not even your house. But you use everything you've stored for yourself. It seems to me it was a family treasure. Maybe it was her personal. In John chapter 12, we are told that this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Now, we know the story. Their brother returned to life, was resuscitated. Lazarus came back to life. And this could be in response to that. This could be just out of coming to terms with who Jesus is. They've been walking with Jesus for a while. They knew him really well. Looks like at this point they realized this is the Lord, this is God. Maybe for Martha and Mary and Lazarus, they knew Jesus was going to be crucified at Passover. Maybe they understood scriptures and they're thinking, this is our opportunity to demonstrate our surrender, our adoration, our gratefulness, our worship of the Lord. Now is the time. This is no doubt an extravagant display of devotion to Jesus Christ. We don't even read how they ask permission from Simon, the, the, the house owner. They, she just did it. Was such 
generous display of, of worship that some are thinking this money could have been given to the poor. This is a waste. You're wasting your, your, your treasure, your, your, your wealth on Christ. Well, in John chapter 12, verse 6, the Bible tells us that whoever this was, obviously it was Judas, it's not that he really cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used it to take what used to be put in it. So Judas is not thinking, oh, you, you, you're wasting the money. We could use this for the poor. He's thinking, uh, I just missed out on the opportunity to steal that one. I just missed out on the chance to pretend I'm putting it in the apostolic treasure, uh, treasure bag. I would have, I would have built myself a nice house. Somebody said that Judas criticized Mary for wasting money, but he wasted his entire life for very little. So Mary pours out her treasure on Christ, adoration, worship, surrender, selflessness. Judas selfishly for very little money is going to waste his life. Now Jesus explains to them, give, gives them an answer. He says say to them, look here, um, I know there are poor people, poor people around you and you have opportunity to take care of them. The Old Testament law had provision and care for the poor. The, the nation of Israel, every citizen had to make sure they leave some food in the garden or remember the temple treasure? or they give some money, especially to take people, uh, care of the uh, vulnerable people. It's like, there's an arrangement for that. What she's doing here is anointing my body and preparing me not only for death, but burial. So their burial traditions was that when somebody died, they smeared them with oil, their form of embalming, or at least making sure, you know, they decomposing body doesn't cause a stench, so they did that with, you know, spices and oils. Now, we know this. As they celebrate Passover, Jesus is going to be arrested the following night, arrayed in court, crucified and buried immediately. So they are not going to find time. There was not going to be time for them to do their entire burial traditions. In fact, remember when he rose again, the women were going there with the old. They're thinking, we missed a chance. We couldn't, we had no access to the body of Christ to give him a decent burial, a traditional burial. So we need to go to the tomb. Somebody helps us roll it out. We anoint his body, smear with, uh, his body with spices and oils, and then seal it. And we've, and, like, we've, we've buried him. Jesus tells them, Lickia, you're not going to have time for that. And what she's doing here is symbolically anointing my body, preparing for my death and for my burial. In fact, they're going to understand this later. Now they're thinking, what are you talking about? But when the Romans take charge of the crucifixion and the burial, they're thinking, ah, Mary, you did it. Now, it's interestingly, it's one of these Marys who, again, is on that team that goes to check the body of Jesus Christ in his grave. So this is not waste. This is symbolic of you. You're literally burying me right now. You're burying me right now. You're anointing me right now. One writer says this about this, says, nothing puts life into men like a dying savior. Get 
you close to Christ and carry the remembrance of him about you from day to day and you will do right and draw your deeds. Come, let us slay sin for Christ was slain. Come, us, uh, come let us bury all our pride for Christ was buried. Come, let us rise to newness of life for Christ was risen. Let us be united with our crucified Lord in his one great object. Let us live and die with him. And then every action of our lives will be very beautiful. Practically, let us pour our everything for Christ. Whether to live for Christ, we live for Christ. Whether to die for Christ, we die for Christ. Whether to die with Christ, we die with Christ. To be buried with Christ, to arise with Christ in newness. Let us do this for Christ. Let us anoint Christ as our beloved, one preacher says. Kiss him with a kiss of affection. Anoint him as our sovereign. Kiss him with a kiss of allegiance. Did he pour out his soul unto death for us? And shall we think any box of ointment too precious to pour out upon him? What she does is not even comparable to what Christ was going to do for her. What we do for Christ is not even comparable to what Christ does for us. We can never ever outgive God. God gave us his life. We give him our lives and then he even gives it back to us. In the giving of the law requiring sacrifices and offerings and eventually the nation of Israel would be unfaithful to that. At one point, not even one point, many times God confronted them. He asked them, look here, do you think you can feed me? So their unfaithfulness was because they felt bad and like, oh, we have to do these sacrifices and we have to sacrifice these animals. We need them for our own food, but then we have to give them to Christ. And they found obedience to God bad in some, and God said, look here, do you think I'm hungry? Like one, at one place it says, if I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you, you wouldn't even be able to prepare for me food enough for my lunch. And before we think of this as a waste or even when we give our all to Christ as, as waste, do you know, do we come to understand how much he gave for us? When we talked about giving, God gives us a whole salary, right? But we struggle to give him back 10%. We struggle with it. And yet he has given us everything more than just a salary. He has given us life and breath and everything. There is a budget for the poor and vulnerable. Now it's time to worship. And worship will cost us. Worship is sacrificial. So the Old Testament picture of worship is take an animal that you could have for yourself as a meal or as a possession, as wealth, and God says, give it to me. And you're thinking, God, if, if I have 20 sheep, you've asked me for one, I'll, I'll have 19 left, God. One less is, is, is not fair, right? That's in our mind. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. The king said to Aruna, No, but I'll surely buy it for, uh, from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. The story is, is this land. David wants to build God a house and he spots the land. He's thinking this would be a perfect place for the temple. He goes to the landowner and says, uh, could you please sell this 
this land to me. And he's like, no, David, you're the king, you have it. You're the king, you can have whatever you want. It's like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm not like Ahab who says, I want the land, and then he grabs it, kills the owner, and then grabs it. No, 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 how much is it? I want to pay for it. He says, I, I, I want to buy it. This is my worship to God, and he says, I cannot give to God that which costs me nothing. I cannot give to God half-hearted commitment. I cannot give to God three-quarter commitment. I want to give God my all. I want to pay the full price. For, it was a threshing floor, a place where they separated seeds from the, from the chaff. It's a threshing floor. It's like, I'll buy it. That is the Temple Mount many claim belongs to them today. David bought that piece of land for the Lord, and the temple was built there. The Muslims think they own it. And you're thinking, really? We, have, we even have record that David bought it. If you look at history when you're doing land transactions, you look at the history of the land. Who was the original owner? And who bought it from that person? And who bought it from the person? And, and who is buying it today? So they look for the history of the land. We look at the history of the land, David bought it. We even have the name of the land owner. We can go down history and figure out he even paid the full price. He had the land title. He had the agreement. This is a picture of worship, Christians. It costed you to get here today, right? Sometimes you're thinking, I should just save my transport money and watch church online, right? Maybe I don't have. I just have that on my phone. I can say. But you know that each time you come to church, each time you are doing something for God, it is going to cost us. That is worship. For Mary, everything, everything. She literally gave away her salary from January to December. Nobody asked her. Jesus did not say, put it on my feet. I am the Lord, right? Pour it on my feet and pour it on my hair. Jesus did not even demand it. This is coming from somebody who really has come to terms with who God is. Like, God is my Savior. This is my King. He deserves my everything. My whole year's salary, my whole life, my everything, break the jar. She didn't, she didn't even unseal it. She didn't even open it and pour carefully. She broke it. So not only did she pour out the contents of the jar, she actually broke the jar to honor God. Like, I don't even want the jar. I'm not going to just pour the oil and then take the jar back home and refill it. No, the jar was broken. I'm going to worship you with my everything. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 44, 45 to 46, again, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus gives them a little parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had to obtain it. The kingdom of God is like us. When we find Christ, just like this merchant, we give our all. Now, this parable can actually be interpreted the other way. Jesus finds us and gives his all for us. And we do the same. We find Jesus Christ. What happens? We give our all. This is in worship, the example or the display of if we have given our life to Christ, there's nothing we can hold back from him. There's nothing. If God wants our alabaster jar, if he wants everything we, we, we own, everything he's given us, like, no problem, God. You, you have it. He says, I want your life. Says, no, you, you have it. I want your hands. You have it. I want your feet. God, have it. This belong to you. This these are things that you've given me. I did not make myself. I did not create myself. I did not amass these things with my own breath. It is your breath. It is your strength. It is your wisdom, God. It is your creation. It is everything you've given, and I'm going to give it back to you. Matthew 22:21. 21. They say to him, 
Caesar's. It was a coin. What coin is this? It was an argument on taxes. He said, this was Caesar's. And he said to them, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And then what happens? Render to God what belongs to God. What does God require of us? Adoration. Give respect to whom respect is due. Give adoration to whom adoration is due. You pay the taxes to Caesar. Give glory to God. Worship God in the beauty of holiness. David said in, I think in 1 Chronicles or 2 Chronicles. Worship is going to cost us. Following God is going to cost us. Obedience to God is going to cost us. Remember the story of the man who had a lot was young? What must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Jesus told him, go get rid of everything you have. And then you'll, you, will, you won't lose it. He says, you will tre have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. He walked away sad. I hope he later on accepted and obeyed what God told him. If not, he lost his earthly treasure and doesn't have any heavenly treasure. He lost both. When we give ourselves to God and we give our all to God, not only do we have life here, we have life forever. We have both. In our selfishness, we're thinking, oh God, the life here, it should be ours. We will live for you there. God says, I'm giving you life right now, and you, you come to me, I give you life right now, and I'll give you life forever. What a win. Another picture of worship that I see in Scripture, many, but I see one in Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 to 12. A picture of heaven, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes all around him, and they do not rest day and night, or night, saying, Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, Whenever the four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created." That's a grand picture of worship for me. Day or night. They weren't thinking, oh, day is for us, night is for the Lord. We'll go for an overnight, right? Oh, night is for us, day is for the Lord. No, day and night belong to God and we will worship. Day and night belong to God and we will keep casting our crowns down before his throne. Day or night, we will sing. You are worthy, O Lord. This is what Mary does. Jesus, you're worthy. You're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. You're worthy to receive everything that I have. Everything I have, you have given to me. And everything I have, I'm going to use to honor you. For you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. To the disciples earlier, I told them, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You have to leave everything behind. Leave for me alone. And take an instrument of death. Follow me to death. I'm giving you life, uh, life right now and life forever. That is worship. Worship is not just giving God 10% or 20% or half of what we have or half what he's given us. Worship is giving God our all. And knowing it all belongs. It's not that, okay, uh, he has given me, so uh, only a portion of it belongs to him. Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything. All of us. Look at what the angels say. You, you made all things. Everything here belongs to you. Men have lived to think these things belong to us. In our sinfulness, 
in our greed, in our selfishness, we think, that's mine. Nothing is ours. Nothing is ours. Everything belongs to God. And at the point, we, uh, to, to our rich young ruler, I said, go give everything. Don't even bring to me. Give, it, give out everything. This lady, he didn't say anything. He didn't say, worship me. He didn't demand it. He didn't require it. Her personal understanding of Christ grew and grew, and she realized he deserves everything. And then Judas, verses 10 to 11, lastly. He's probably thinking, I, I lost out on that money, so I'm going to have to, maybe he's angry at Jesus Christ. Some say, this guy is so angry at Christ, it's like, I'm just going to have this guy killed. He caused me a financial loss, right? He, he kind of busted my deal. Perhaps he's feeling hurt, one preacher says, when Jesus rebuked him. Perhaps it was plain greed. Well, we know what it is. Sin. Sinfulness. In Mark chapter 9, we went through Mark chapter 9, verse 31. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he's killed, he will rise the third day. He knew this was coming. Mark 10, 33, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They knew this was coming. He knew this was coming. Matthew 26, 14 to 16, Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted to him uh, 30 pieces of silver, so from that time, he sought opportunity to give him over. That was the cost of a slave. The one thing that amazes me about Jesus' relationship with Judas is that he knew Judas was going to do this and loved him the same. I don't think any one of us can do that. Have you ever known that somebody is going to do you harm and you love them the same? Anyone? You probably love them, but from a distance, right? A good distance. So many struggle with this story, especially Judas. Did he repent after this, or was he just doomed to do this? One scripture says, you know, this is going to happen, but what to him uh, through whom this happens? Well, we know for sure that Judas made his own choice. He said, how much can you give me? 30 pieces of silver? Good. Deal. I'm going to do that. Away from his betrayal of Jesus Christ, I love the picture of God's grace upon him. God loves each one, each one of us the same, even when he knows we are going to hurt him. Now that's love. We think of love as, I love you, right? And I'm expecting you to love me back. Oh yeah, that's love. So we kind of, everybody, we, we reciprocate, which is good, right? I'm not saying that is not love, but this is the picture of God's sacrificial love. I know you're going to kill me. I know you're going to sell me off for the cost of a slave, very cheap. But I'm going to love you to death. I'm going to love you anyway. Think of the wicked of the wicked alive today. Jesus loves them the same. And we struggle with that, don't we? We're thinking, that one God, don't love him. Right? I am the good one. We are the good ones, the Christians. Yeah, we are the good ones. You, you should love us. Oh, man, just, just judge them. In fact, it shouldn't even rain on them, right? You just coach them with the sun. This is called God's common grace. He loves everybody to death. He loves those he knows 
will do this. And tell you what, Judas kind of looks ugly here. So is our sin, right? We've done this to Christ. A contrast. Mary gives her all. Judas takes very little against Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13, 17, Paul writes to Timothy about end time lifestyle. People are going to give themselves to so much wickedness. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, in righteousness that the man or the woman of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. He says to Timothy, much as people are growing in their wickedness, much as Judas decided to sell off Christ for cheap, much as the Jewish leaders plotted to kill their Savior, an innocent man, you must continue in the truth. And we live in a world that has both. We have those who have given themselves fully to Christ. And then you have, we have those who even when they understand who Christ is, will still choose to commit wickedness. That's the reality we live in today that some are walking in the straight and narrow path going to heaven and others on the other way, a highway leading to destruction. And meanwhile, they can see the narrow and straight path to heaven. Not that God has closed it, it's open. They can see and the people are going there, but they choose to go the wide path that goes to destruction. Some give their all to Christ to God in worship and adoration their entire lives. Others remain selfish to their own destruction. So Paul tells Timothy and tells us, this is the challenge that we have. We can choose to walk and worship with Jesus or we have to make the choice. And we have to make that choice every day. Nobody makes that choice for us. And I'm sure it breaks your heart much as it breaks mine to see somebody walking away from Christ. But each one has to make that choice. And God will hold them responsible for the choice they personally made. Some choose to be loyal to Christ. Some betray Christ. Some choose to surrender to Christ. Some choose to reject Christ. Some give their all. Some remain selfish. Some are selfless. Others, selfish. And we know the choice to make. We know the best choice to make, right? We all know the best choice to make. It's what Martha does. I mean, Mary does. We choose to be loyal to Christ. We choose to surrender to Christ. We choose to give our all. We choose to follow Christ. So we see two teams here. Team Jesus and team against Jesus. Which team do you belong to? Team Jesus. Team Jesus is the team we should belong. And he wants us to be on that team. He's made it possible for us to be on that team. He's called us to be on his team. He has literally laid his life down for us to join that team. And if you haven't done so, please do that today. If you know somebody, we obviously all have somebody in mind who really needs to surrender to Christ. Please point, point them this direction. 
point them to heaven. And in verse 9, I love it how Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached, her deed is going to be remembered. It is in Scripture. It is in the pages of God's inspired inerrant Scripture, and there it will be forever. Her worship, embedded in Scripture forever. Do we want to invest our lives in things that won't last or in the eternal? Again, we have to make that choice. The things that we do for Christ, recorded and embedded forever. The things that we do for ourselves, how far does it go? In just a few hours, it's gone. It's, it's sea of forgetfulness. Isn't it better for us to make decisions that we see here, God himself commands, records, and eventually will reward? Do we want to continue living for ourselves or to live for Christ? We can choose to be the Jewish leaders who plot to kill him. We can choose to be Judas who walks away from him, having walked with him, having walked closely with Christ, this, I don't know if this bothers you, but it really bothers me if I see somebody walking with Christ for years and all of a sudden they kind of just go the other direction. I'm thinking, what exactly happened? Like, what happened? You walked with Christ. Judas, what happened? He loved you. He knew you were a thief. He chose you to be on his team. He showed you his grace, his mercy, his faithfulness. What happened? What excuse will you have before? The Lord God, the day of judgment. Choose to be a Mary. You choose to be a Mary. God, we're going to pour down and pour out everything. Everything for you. Amen? Let's stand and close in prayer. Lord, we want to lay down our lives holy and acceptable holy and acceptable and willing sacrifices for you. Lord, when we give our lives to you, not only do you give us life here, you'll, you give us life everlasting. Lord, when we hold back our lives from you, we get nothing. We don't get life here, and we got, we've got no life in the end. So Lord, fill our hearts with your worship. Fill our hearts with our knowledge and adoration and our surrender to your God. Day and night, just as the, as the angels do, just like Mary, holding back nothing from you. Our feet, our hands, our heart, our everything, oh God. Lord, it's not that you want the jar and the oil, Lord, you want us. And when we have given our lives to you, Lord, we will not hold back the jar and the oil. We'll pour it down for your glory. So lead us, O oh God, lead us. Lead us the direction, O oh God. Lead us to bow down before you day and night to sing for you, to praise you, to live for you, to glorify your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
the rising sun, the Lord is my salvation.
dominion, both now and forever. And God's people said, God bless you all. Thank you for coming.